D and T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Warning. This show contains spoilers, bad language, and Nick. You have been warned. Welcome to the Book of the Celestial Temple Book Club. Here are your hosts, Terry Lynn, Nick, Mike and Steve. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of Book of the Celestial Temple Book Club. I'm Midnight Shadow and with me today we have Ceridium. Kabla. And the lovely Terry Lynn. Good afternoon, morning and hello. How is everybody? Great, how are you Midnight? I'm good. Better now I haven't had any sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Better now that you haven't had any sleep. What is wrong with that sentence? <laughs> oh, just about everything. At the beginning of the week, I think so. I'd had too much <laughs> sleep, and I'd spent the midweek just like uh, zombified because I've had too much. But I'm weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today we are discussing the book "Cast No Shadow," which was written by James Swallow. Yay, um, James Swallow! And um, it's part of the original series, and it's basically the Vaughn backstory, isn't it, this one? I would say so. The Elias yeah. Vaughn backstory, yeah. Definitely. Although there is some backstory from some other characters. Yes. Um, as we shall get into. But yeah, um, this was released back in July 2011, and it's based in, I think it's the year 2300. Primarily, if I can remember rightly. Um, although it does skip between sort of what happened in, was it Star Trek VI, Undiscovered Country? Very much so. Well, it, it through Savix, is it Savix? Uh, I'm, my mind Valeris. is running. Valer- Valeris. It's Valeris. Valeris. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Through Valeris' point of view, right. we also go back a lot further um, to her own childhood even. So it is, so parts of it go back even further is just the point I'm trying to, blah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem that I had is for most of the um, Star Trek films, I'd seen them so long ago and I've seen most of them just the once that I couldn't remember the character um, Valaris at all. So I knew it was really played... yeah. So I'm trying to remember the story and everything else. The only thing I could remember is it was played by Kim Cattrall, and that was about the only thing. <laughs> it's just like uh... <laughs> it's just like I must rewatch that. I must rewatch that. And I'm reading through the book, like I really must rewatch this film, and I never did get time to in the end. <laughs> but uh... oops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thing is, is I don't you... have them on DVD, so it's just like oh, I must um, find a place to get it from or something, and yeah, didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> so. And have you watched it since? No, well, I only finished the book right a few weeks ago. I, uh, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, uh, Undiscovered Country, Star Trek Undiscovered Country happens to be, I don't know, uh, you can usually tell a person's age by where they place undiscovered country in their list. When you're young, it tends to be like towards the bottom of the list. But mm. as the older you get, the more you appreciate the story of it. And it tends to go up higher and higher and higher. 
And I would have to say that Undiscovered Country is now my second favorite Star Trek. I'll watch it over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I'll watch it over and over, and it definitely ranks high on mine. Uh, I didn't and, really start and... getting into the films um, until the Next Generation ones were out, because I didn't really get into Star Trek until sort of, sort of the mid-90s. So, although I'd watched a lot of them here and there, I didn't, as I said, properly get into it until sort of quite late. And then at that point, you'd got a lot of the sort of the TNG films coming out. So, and sort of from as I've sort of mentioned before, TOS just it never grabbed me. I didn't like it for various reasons. One, it just looked awful, especially compared to other TV stuff that was coming out at the time. Um, but also just the way that sort of certain, like the way women were still portrayed in it. Sort of, I know it was a sign of the times, but I just didn't like the TOS for that. Now I've got, um, I've gotten to like the TOS a little bit better because I look at the story more since sort of reading the books. So when I have started doing some of the watching of doing the entire TOS series, which I still haven't watched all of it, um, I've come to appreciate the storylines more and sort of the morals behind the story rather than more what was on screen, which as a teenager I was sort of more into. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm sort of catching up with a lot of the TOS stuff. and But uh, um, yeah, as I said, kept reading the book and it's just like, yeah, really must watch that film again. <laughs> yes, agree that you need to watch the film again. <laughs> yes, most definitely. So, what was your first? Uh, how should I say it? Your first impression of Cast No Shadow, Steve? Um, I really liked it. I wanted to see where this was all going, because one of the things that was left lingering is sort of Valeris and how she was sort of developing. Because it started off, she was basically just completely shut down in the sort of hospital. Didn't want to speak to the counselor. Um, didn't want to deal with what was obviously she had something she needed to work through. Right. But she she didn't want to seem weak in a way. She didn't want to explain herself for anything else to anybody. She just wanted to be left alone as if her being on her own and dealing with whatever she's dealing with was her own sentence in a way um more than sort of where she was um, very vulcan like don't you think yeah but <laughs> i liked the way that she'd sort of twisted a lot of the sort of vulcan logic and thoughts about dealing with emotions right um and the way that her character in the book develops and sort of she starts to realize a lot of things about herself as things go on, um, and especially coming up to near the end of the book, um, when, of course, she does to somebody what Spock did to her. Mm -hmm. And that moment when she realises, sort of, typical Vulcan thing, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, that she had to do this. Even it really she... turns everything on its ear. I mean, quite, quite literally, but... Uh, yeah. It really does turn her, it tweaks her, I would guess you would say. Yeah, and I also thought, because if you sort of bring it into sort of what's going on today, I thought it was still sort of quite relevant because there's still, especially recently, there's been a lot of right. stuff in the news about the torture of um, combatants and things to right. get information um, to help save more people. And basically... That is what Spock did to her and she did to somebody else. And it sort of makes you think, although you really don't like the fact that this stuff is happening, or a lot of people don't, um, it sort of does make you think how much need there is for this sort of behaviour by our governments and military to get this information and whether or not it is actually effective. Interesting. Um, so... When I was reading this, it made me sort of think of that as well. Um, um, but that's what stories do. They sort of make you think. And sort of, yeah, with 
things like um, stuff that's coming into the news about the torture of uh, um, com people by sort of US and things how, like that recently. How recently ha did you finish reading the book? Um, it's in it's all for a week and a half ago, two weeks. Okay. Um, I had read it a, f a couple, few months back. Uh, so I guess a lot of the, the torture stuff wasn't in the news. So it wasn't quite that I didn't quite make that connection. Right. Uh, for me, I was seeing, you know, the, the cycle of abuse, you know, what, right. you know, the, a person was abused and sadly, despite their best efforts, they end up becoming the abuser. So um, that's what I saw mostly in the story, but you made an interesting point um, earlier on regarding um, Vulcan, Vulcan logic. Uh, it, it, logic by itself is a very dangerous thing because you can twist it and use it to justify anything. Right. Yeah. You know, you have to have some kind of moral compass in order to, 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 to guide logic. And I think for Valeris's character, it, that was missing. Yeah. That's an interesting take on it, Mike. I think that um, I think she saw herself as having a penultimate moral compass. Yeah, but it wasn't. It was, but it wasn't right. Yeah, it was. It was. It was off kilter compared to what is standard, I guess, and that, that has, I think, a lot to do with the people that she associated with early on in her in her life and her career, which we see throughout the story. Yeah. So it, it kind of begs to say, does Valeris, was she kind of bred to do what she did? I mean, if she's the sum of the parts of her past, do you think that there was ever really any hope for her not to have done what she had done? Or do That's you a think good that, question. Do you think that the people around her, including her superiors like Cart, uh, Cartwright and everybody, were just using her to their own ends? What and, think... and make her a victim all over again? I don't think... Cartwright used her. He recognized something in her which had been there since she was a child. Because basically she was traumatized by what the Klingons did. And she was at a point in her life where she was still trying to master her emotions. And her parents didn't give her the support she needed. And she suppressed it in such a way she thought she was doing the right way and being Vulcan about it. But Wasn't also, one of her parents killed? Or both of her parents killed or something? I know people... The driver was killed. Okay. I think they were going to kill her mother. I think... I think they ended up taking her to sick bay, but I can't remember if she died. I th actually, I think she did. Yeah, you're right. But, um, yeah, I think it was more to do with the support she got, which if you look about when people say it's about how people are sort of brought up and things like that, whether or not they turn out good or bad, um, I think what James had written was a good way to sort of show that because she was never given support and help that she needed because of the way like the Vulcan logic was, that basically bred in her a hate which just festered and or when she expressed it, Cartwright picked up on it because yep. he had a hate for the Klingons as well. I, um, and, and again, like attracts like. Yeah. And again, but is that as, you know, that's one of the biggest things about Undiscovered Country that I really, really do like is that Cartwright is merely just, Cartwright and Valeris's point of view really yeah. is just the tip of an iceberg of how. So many people, you know, hate the what is and always has been their only enemy, their greatest and only enemy. And I mean, I don't know if it I know it meant when they made the film, it was supposed to be, you know, a touch on, you know, what do you do? I mean, the, it's it's the end of the USSR. I mean, the Russia has been United States greatest enemy for a generation ever since World War Two. And all of a sudden how an entire generation was raised, thought, and taught how to believe. Turn around and you look in the, in, through the mirror, and literally through a mirror, and you see 
that your enemy is nothing more than yourself. I mean, you look through it and you go, oh, wow, they're, they're all just, you know, trying to make a good life for themselves. They're trying to do this too. Their, their way of life wasn't, you know, they couldn't support that way of life. And now there's millions of innocent people who are, and, and it tweaks you because you don't understand. It's like, well, wait a minute. I was raised to hate these, literally hate these people. So you're, from that generation's perspective, you can see where Cartwright is coming from and where Valeris was nothing more than a product of the generation before her, um, especially in light of her personal experiences with the Klingons. And it, I love the way that James wrote it to the point where it's like it, he turns you on your ear. He turns you and makes you look into the deeper psyche of somebody who, by all their own accounts is doing something right and did something right. And really at the beginning, you know, in the, in this book, truly believe she was still doing something right. You know, he didn't yeah. realize the outcome and how that could change and tweak. And how do you deal with that kind of guilt? Yeah. There's what I also found interesting was, um, not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Is it Kaj? Um, I don't know. I, if on... you're asking me, yeah, especially when it comes to written names and to figure out how it's supposed to be yeah. pronounced, forget it. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was in the Klingon Imperial Intelligence. Okay, her. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found her to have a lot of parallels with Valeris on some aspect. She had, um, she'd got issues because of the death of her sister and she was out for revenge as well. But when it came down to it, she put the needs of what was best for her people above her hate and sort of revenge thirst. Whereas, sort of, was it seven years earlier when Valeris did what she did? She hadn't. And I thought in some ways there are some parallels with the two. And I sort of liked how the Klingon was written to be, in a way, the better person. Because usually you put... People often consider the Federation as the good guys and the Klingons as the bad guys. Sort right. of thing. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting the way sort of those two characters are actually written, so it sort of turned it around in a way. Not sure if anybody else... I didn't that. really... To be honest with you, I didn't even think about it, but it's a wonderful point that you bring up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... You're you're right. I mean, Klingons are usually portrayed one way, and it's uh, usually the thoughtless brute, which I'm sure Nick would agree. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but she, although she she is a, a you know a spy, and she's you know working um, to to get to the root of this this terrorist group, right? Mm. Uh, so she is working towards the best of her people and but she's also willing to a point to 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 accept help from from an enemy which <laughs> although she's not sure if i remember correctly she wasn't sure if she right. was actually a friend or an enemy right well james but, even keeps you guessing the entire way yeah. through for both of them really about how they're actually going to do that because there are points throughout the book where each of them could have killed the other and not looked back <laughs> yeah. and it's just like is it gonna happen <laughs> yeah um, but um no i thought it was good the way that james Waller had sort of played those characters against each other um but with each other um <laughs> so it's always just like oh is it gonna kick off right now and with everything else that's sort of going on and especially when they're on that asteroid and you think, yeah, Valeris, is this really her or is she playing along? Because the entire time I'm reading that part of it, it's just like, no, I'm sure he's just going to sort of do something and she's actually the good guy in this part of the story. And as it's going along, it's just like, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the one thing I do appreciate about his style anyway. I mean, and, like I said, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it's also telling that at the, at the end of the story, you know, 
uh, paralleling the you know what what ends up happening between the two these two powers um, after after you know undiscovered country is there's a, a almost a friendship there afterward and even between these two characters that friendship you know starts uh, they, they they start to like each other a little bit it, which yeah. I think you know it was was a nice touch because. People that that had hated each other so much when they did not even know them, you know, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, after working together, going through some shit, yeah, <laughs> they come out of it with at least a respect for 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 each other and what to me seemed like you know the the seeds of, of a potential friendship that. Yeah. So. Yeah, or at I think, least I think there it, was the it, respect between them that they'd sort of earned, um, even if it wasn't a proper sort of friendship, at least. I yeah, you know, like I said, it, it's like the seeds of it. They they're yeah. they're on on the way. You can you can see how not only these two empires were starting to come together, but also how these two people are also going to be, you know, starting to come together. And right. I would love to see them, you know, come together again in, in a future book. Definitely. Well, as I said, the way they, the story was written, that they sort of played off each other in so many different ways. It really did work. Um, so it's always a good read. Um, the one thing that I was kind of disappointed about the book and it's not really a disappointed disappointment but um the cover let me down i expected more spock <laughs> <laughs> yeah well <laughs> welcome welcome to the world of pocket books covers you know don't yeah. always they don't always pick up and and usually are misleading they're just meant to help you know draw the next sales yeah. yeah well improve sales too it's like Oh, there's a Spock book when really it isn't. It's a it's a Valeris book. And that 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 would have been fine, but again, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more Spock. Um, you know, uh, granted did we see him at the end? I think all, all we saw him was at the beginning when when their their relationship or the the, the strain in the relationship how how it had manifested over the years and how it just uh festered. I think he did make an appearance at the end of the book because um, he goes to see Valeris, if I remember rightly. No, she didn't, didn't she have a new identity? Yeah, she gets a new identity, but I think just before then, did oh, Scott okay. go see her? I don't recall. It's been I a think... while for me. I started watching, um, watching, started reading the new um, Section 31 Disavowed. So I'm halfway through that already. Wow. <laughs> so. From one spy novel to another. To another. I was going to say, <laughs> so you went straight from an Elias Vaughn into Section 31, The Disavowed with, you know, that's got to be pretty fun. Yeah. And, I don't, and I was, I'd also just read two chapters as well about two hours before the show. So I just only thought, as I sort of put my Kindle down, I thought, I really shouldn't have been reading that. Just now I hope show. I don't get confused. Well, yeah, welcome to our world. <laughs> oh, it's too funny. Yeah, I, I, I read, I read that book at, shortly after reading Cast No Shadow as well, and uh, yeah, so I'm trying to get different time frames, but you know, still uh, a lot of similar, not similarities, but there are parallels in the story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, that is a great book, by the way. Uh, but yeah, um, between as we sort of, we've sort of talked a bit now about um, cards and, fact, and well, real Ooh. quick, I'm also reading a spy book now as well. <laughs> I'm reading uh, Kobayashi Maru. Uh, oh, Enterprise. The Enterprise so, book. Yeah. So again, another spy book. <laughs> uh, they they're funny. good reads, aren't they? Yeah, they are good stories. Um, I, I'm getting to the point where I'm feeling a little burned out with spy stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it it kind of goes back to as much as I as much as I give grief 
to people about, you know, the overuse of Section 31. I mean, because it's easy. Yeah. But you have to admit they're fun. Yes. Yeah. You know, I can't help myself. I have to read them. Damn it. Um, Another. Uh, yeah. No, I was pleased <laughs> to see that they were used so little in this. Right. Because when they're back in San Francisco at one point, there's a bit of sort of the spy stuff going on, and you think must be section 31. It actually turns out it's more to do with the Romulans, actually, than section 31, because they're literally just the go-between. So I thought that was actually a bit refreshing, yeah. because um, it was the Romulans trying to figure out what was going on and turn things to their own agendas. To their own advantage, as they often yeah. do. Romulans. <laughs> <laughs> So, but no, I thought that was good that given it was sort of a spy novel, that Section 31 was more or less just left out of it. So I, I did like that because, as we've said, often anything spy related it, uh, is Section 31. Yep. And you think, well, and, and it kind of does a disservice because Section 31 is just this supposed to be what this serious. It's not even affiliated with Starfleet Intelligence. No. Yeah, As, it's um, its own thing. Supposed... Starfleet Intelligence has its own spy, is its own right. spy agency. Right, it's its own I mean... spy network. They're just more out of the closet. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing I, is, it's just... is, for an organization that's supposed to be in the shadows and not known about, they seem to be known about by an awful lot of people. <laughs> yeah, right. there's a spotlight on them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, why not You know, shine like... Um... A Section 31 symbol, you know, across the galaxy or something. It's like, this is an op. Uh. <laughs> but again, I, 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 I give grief. And I do. I admit, I give grief to people in the Foundry who do Foundry missions in Star Trek Online. And uh, you just go, oh, it's another 31 case. You just, and you do. You just kind of go, oh, it's another. Because, because they're fun and because they're so easy to use, they, they, they stand the chance of being overused. Yeah. And uh, although not... I don't think, well, Castor and the Shadow came out pretty early before any of the Section 31 books, but now we're getting Section 31 books. Well, I, I don't think I've written anything Section 31 quite yet. I think I've, I've done a little bit of intelligence, but. Yes. Yeah. And I don't mind those. I mean, again, I'm. It, it just means to me that the the author understands that section thirty one yeah. is. It's There's a, a difference beast. between the two. I mean, there is. If it's if it's something that 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 directly impacts you know the Federation, it should be obviously it should be um, section thirty one or not section thirty one. It should be intelligence and. Intelligence is more likely, or seems like more likely, to be working with other organizations, you know, um, in in order to kind of because doesn't doesn't like the CIA work with like all the other spy agencies in order to go after the bad guys? You'd right? think so. You'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. Whereas a rogue organization like Thirty One, they're gonna be doing their own thing, not telling nobody nothing, not wanting to work with anybody except people that they know, trust, and, and can manipulate. I don't know. Now, of course, one of the people we haven't really talked much about is Elias Vaughn, because it's supposed to be part right. of the Vaughn backstory. Now, I think this was my first exposure to him. Or I had, I think, I read DS9, uh, like three or four books in the DS9 series. The, in the Axanar? In the, in not Axanar, um, Avatar? The Avatar, uh, it was, it was like is five the, stories in one book. Is the, um, the, sh the load of short stories, because we covered those oh. um, last year. Um, so yeah, they're the only ones that I've really had any sort of, I've seen Elias Vaughn apart from on some of the other DS9 ones where he's in the coma. Um, yeah, that we've read. pretty much. Um, that, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, right before he dies. <laughs> so that's been the sort of the only thing that I've seen, but he was an interesting character, and it's always, it'd be interesting to know more about who he, he is He was and a what he's fish done. out of water. Yeah, and I love the bit in the book because they 
actually because of course he's got this beard when we see him um what's this 70 years later sort of thing in the ds9 series and there's a bit in the book which explains why he actually has this beard because of course after all the stuff that's been going on he's actually sort of grown something and somebody's i can't remember now but, but it explains because someone says how oh, it looks good on you or something <laughs> Um, Sorry, I, I, had, I had muted my mic by accident. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. So I, I, I thought that was very good. It sort of said that's why, because as the writers always do, they always sort of describe the characters and they always do it each time in each book because you ne- they never know where the people are going to start off reading. Right. Um, so, of course, he's always described with this really nice um, um, sort of polished sort of beard and um, sort of yeah the start of him having a beard is when it's either Kaj or Valaris turn around and said um, a beard might actually suit you um, most humans have I think it was a weak chin or something like that <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just the way I think I he says something like um, thanks for the tip and I'm thinking right well that explains why he's a got this beard <laughs> and I, I thought that was just a nice little sort of um right on. wink back to the other books um so yeah i sort of uh, <laughs> picked up on that one <laughs> well i i had a, a, ch- a child uh whispering in my ear um so but what what i what, what i appreciated about him was the fact that he he was so po- so I don't, I don't, I don't know if positive is the right word, but he was, he was adamant, <laughs> he, adamant about what he believed in terms of, of what he uncovered, the information that he possessed. He yeah. was so sure that this was something that he went and staked everything. <laughs> yeah. He put it all on the line. And although there were moments when he had doubts, but he, he was determined to see see it to, through to the end, and in the end, he, it, he was justified. And I, I, you know, it was like you got to respect the guy that that lays it all out, puts it all on the line, and and good, bad, or whatever, you know, sticks it out. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciated that about Vaughn. Yeah, I liked it when sort of Sulu. And that he sort of approaches them and they're like, you coming? He's like, huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, he, he didn't even think anyone, anyone was going to take him seriously. But he, he did find a few supporters along the way that just encouraged him just enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's so, a truly yeah. unique character. I mean, he's a novel. He's in the novels only. Not a canon character, canon meaning he's not in the films mm-hmm. or any of the movies. This is he was created purely for the novels, and not unlike Diego Reyes, right? Mm-hmm. A, a unique, strong leader character, and um, it, somebody else that you know. Once they you get to the, the oh, talk, <laughs> once the authors had the freedom of creating a new character that they had the freedom of killing off. They could do you know, whatever they want with him. They could do whatever they wanted with him. And that's what – I think that's what makes him such a unique character. I mean because he's – for our listeners, he's more than in, in just the DS9 novels. He's mentioned in Star Trek novels, TNG novels, and uh, Corps of Engineers, I think. Yeah? He gets around. I think he's in a couple – he does get around. <laughs> but then again, you know, what do you expect for a man like him? Yeah. <laughs> right on. But, no, it, it was really good. Because you also, as well with Valaris, you, there's a lot of time where it's literally, it's either him, you're seeing the story on his point of view, or it's Valaris for the most part. Um, and because he was so young and green, or all his doubts, and it's just like, no, I have to see this through. And yeah, it was just like, he knew that if he did give up, that everything that he tried to push would just be lost. 
and not to mention the amount of lives. And um, I think it really sort of goes to show where he ends up later on um, in the sort of books. Um, but I love the bit right at the end where, of course, Section 31 approach him. And he's just like, oh, so now you come and speak to me after sort of so many months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's just like, hmm, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, didn't his boss kind of like change his tune about him as well? Um, I think in no, because he requested that he he basically got him transferred to another unit in the um, Dark yeah, League Intelligence. He, he, I think he got him field duty, which is what he's been wanting all this time, and no one really believed he could do. Oh, no, no, no. That that wasn't his boss. Oh. His boss didn't like what he did so much that he basically shut him out and got him transferred to another oh, okay. unit within Starfleet Intelligence, okay. if I remember rightly. Um, but I think it was his boss's boss that got him the field okay. work. Because um, it's the person who was working with on it, um, Sulu and that, I think, um, who talked to them. I can't quite remember now. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, forgive me for, for you know my, my memory and too many Star Trek books with spies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, it all starts to merge. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's, that's the thing, when it's like you're talking about whether it's Star Trek or Stargate. You start talking about an episode and it's just like, oh, hang on. Was that the episode that this happened in or was this? Because, of course, all these different sci-fi series, they've all spanned so many decades and got so hundreds of episodes. And it's just like, damn it. Ah. Mm. <laughs> all the stories just all merge so much. Merge together. <laughs> yeah, I, it's I the same with the books. It's just like, this is familiar. Have I seen or read this before? Was that Star Trek? Was now was that this person? <laughs> um, before I know it's all like Corbin Hour's gone, it's like, damn it, I could have read another chapter. Or but but that's that's the beauty of, of some of these rich universes, these these very long lived IPs. It, it's it's not like it's not like, you know, what it's not like Spider Man where they get they, they they're they're kinda like stuck in a temporal loop where every you know three or four years or every three movies they decide to do a reboot and tell the same story over and over and over again star trek when they when they start over they don't start they, they don't start over they no they, they flash a light in your eyes oh no that's just lens flare <laughs> hey <laughs> But what they, what they've done in the past is is they have expanded the universe instead of collapsing in on itself and starting over is the point yeah. I'm trying to make. And other shows, Stargate as an example, has done that as well. Um, although, yeah, they're with, with 2009, Star Trek got a reboot. In uh, I think in 2015, Stargate is going to essentially get a reboot. So you know, reboots do happen, and I can understand it the need for it every once in a while, once you have this rich universe and it starts getting a little too cluttered, you kind of lose the ability to play in it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so I can understand the need for, you know, to kind of sort of start over, reset, a reset button every now and again. But I, I think there's a desire in entertainment industry to hit the reset button way too often we yeah. we, we we have the jj verse i hope they don't want once jj or once you know bad robot finishes their run with the films I, although i kind of hate to say it i hope they don't just hit the reset button again uh, I, I don't know not if that either. I really don't. I hope not either. I I know that. Well, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But I'm okay. hearing more and more rumors about you know what's going on with Bad Robot and Paramount. Mm -hmm. and blah blah blah. Yeah. Ooh, be that as it may, I'm with you. I love, I love this cast. I like the idea of where it's at. I don't mind it being in a new universe. I just don't want them to to you know, destroy it, what's. I don't want it to be mirror universe. I don't want it to be yeah. the same stories over and over again, just with a different twist. Yeah. I, you know, I like everybody. Tell saying, something new. New, tell us and get create. It's a whole new universe. Create a whole new enemy. 
go for it. Make it fun. And um, I would, I, I'm with you. I would like that too. Um, I would also, here it comes. I would also like to think that that universe doesn't have section 31. <laughs> it'll be section 32 instead oh that'd be uh, section 47 wouldn't that be helpful? <laughs> what would that mean what, what would that what would that entail what would section 47 entail uh, can there under be strobe light, lights and dancing yeah i was gonna say under it's just a ra it's just raves it's just <laughs> undercover undercover raves and uh <laughs> 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 So getting back to the book. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> now what did you most like about it, Mike? Was there a particular part that you really just loved? Well, looking back at it, I I have appreciation for for I I, I what what jumps out in my mind right now after hearing your question is the scene on the on the asteroid or what it was it? A, I think it was an asteroid, right? Are you talking about the asteroid or um, the Praxis mini asteroid? It's where they were playing with the bombs and stuff. Where they were actually building it. Yeah. Yeah. The big yeah. asteroid, yeah. The, the base of the, is it Kashaya? Um, no. No. Uh, it's got to be the Praxis one because it's, it's the actual attack on, on the Klingon. On Kronos. Yeah, so it, yeah. the Praxis asteroids. Yeah. I, for that scene, and it's probably because of all of the recent, you know, space stuff that has been going on, you know, lately, um, you know, with Orion's launch, the Rosetta mission to a comet, you know, so that has, is what jumps up at, oh. into my mind now that you've asked that question to me, you know, so it's like all here, here, here it is, this, this mission to this to this asteroid and they're trying, you know, although they're trying to save the Klingon or uh, planet, uh, Kronos, the Klingon homeworld, you know, it, it, it's got, it had that, that sense of adventure and danger and, you know, and it was just like, yeah, I, I, I like that. What about you, Terry? I personally just liked the idea or, or appreciated James's take on, on the relationships that and and the points of view that you get from Valeris about again because this was backstory for me it was mostly backstory for a movie that I absolutely adore and mm -hmm. with the other intrigue and stuff like that I think to be honest with you this was my first foray into Elias Vaughn so I was getting to know a character that everybody else seemed to have known for quite a long time and uh, he did a, a phenomenal job to the point where it's like, oh, now I've got to go back and read all of his books <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, that's We're what happens. Oh, and it's true. But I, I adored his character, but I really have to say I was most appreciative of the of the unique and uh, kind of uh, twisted – the insight, that's a better word, into Valeris's way of, yeah. of twisting her own and 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 actually being more Vulcan than you realize because you know, Spock was kind of that way throughout most of his life, but it isn't until he's so comfortable with himself and it took him to die to do it, right? Mm hmm Spock allowing for certain types of emotional philosophy to come in and temper his Vulcan is is the lesson he kept trying to to teach to Valeris during the movie and it's and it's something she doesn't even quite grasp until you realize that she's starting to figure it out for herself book that's what I appreciated was that symmetry right on how about you Steve for me it's the relationship between Valeris Kaj and in some ways Vaughn as well but mainly those two Especially when they're in the engine room of the ship heading towards Praxis and Kronos. Um, they start having this sort of sarcastic banter. And I just really love the to and fro between them. Um, that bit especially just really made me sort of laugh. Um, I think that was probably the best part for me. Um, but yeah, it's all as Terry said, it was the relationships between yeah. the three main characters of the storyline. 
Wow. Um, I, after hearing both of your answers, I feel like, damn, I need to change my answer now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I love it. I really do. And and that's the beauty of it, too. I mean, it that's the beauty of all the Star Trek novels. It just fills in missing pieces, and then we get to chew them up and say, okay, this is what it meant to me. Yeah. Um I I do adore him. what 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 do we have on deck next, Mr. Steve? Um, have you decided um, yet? Yeah, it's. I was thinking about um, because it's going to season three next. Well, now, we have a few a few books that we've scheduled and didn't do, so maybe we can go back and do some of those if they're interesting ones yeah well that's what's going to say is a bit strange because at the moment it's scheduled for the ones that we should have had near the sort of christmas time now which were going to be some of the shorter books right so what i was thinking of doing is maybe having a look at the order we've got some of these in um after the show and actually um having a look at the ones that we didn't get to because of sort of schedules and things like that um so what we'll do is we'll announce on the main GNT show what we'll be doing next. Excellent. Um, Great. I think so. Well, uh, uh, thanks to Mr. James Swallow for writing. Pass no shadow. I'm sure. Thank you, right. James. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, James. Thank you, Lord Swallow. And um, uh, that was from Nick. I'm just letting you know. Nick would have kicked my ass if I hadn't called him something, you know, Semi-royal. Yeah, I referred to royalty some, some <laughs> way, or nobility. And um, you can figure out what you can, you can figure out, you can, we can figure out what book we're going to touch on next in the next book club, and then we'll see. Where <laughs> I didn't say that. We're going to keep them guessing until we're gonna the keep end. Them guessing. And then right, we're going to say, right. tomorrow, we're going to read this book, or tomorrow, we're going to, you know talk about this book i don't know there's a lot coming out i'll tell you there's There's so much and uh speaking of new books what the pop-up book is available in the uk now by uh uh terry erdman and paula block yep awesome book and the star trek ships of the line edited by doug drexler and margaret clark and the text by michael okuda is out now mind you this is the second uh edited version of of the book it's the now in red there are a lot of the same artwork that you saw in the first volume but there's a lot of new stuff so it's beautiful beautiful uh computer generated art even sketches hand drawn it's just beautiful stuff and uh I, you can pick that up through startrek.com amazon or your favorite bookseller all right you Take us away. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. And we will catch you next time. Until then, goodbye, everyone. Kabla. Live long and prosper. And for Nick, Joel on True. Music for the GNT show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation. T-shirt is a busy little beaver production.